please. Okay, great. Welcome everyone, um, and thank you for coming to panel 1B. We are titled Gender, Sexuality, and Sexualization, um, and we are aiming to run for about an hour and 45 minutes, um, and we're hoping to give you about a 10-15 minute break afterwards before we move on to panel 2A slash B. Um, so my name is Fatima. Um, for those of you who weren't there for the intro, I am a co-founder of the Savar Collective, and I will be your chair for this panel. Um, we have a lot of very exciting papers lined up for you, including topics such as Pakistani Urdu writing, the queer courtesan, Muslim women in Kerala, and Kashmiri women's poetry. Um, there are no um, suggested content warnings for this panel. I would just like to go over a few quick things um, before we get started. So for Q&A, you are welcome to post questions as speakers are talking in the chat, um, and we will put them aside and we will have a Q&A at the end of the panel. If you would like to raise your hand at the end of the panel and ask a question then aimed at everyone in general, that's also fine, um, but it will happen at the end of the panel. Um, there's a general reminder for time limits for speakers that's in the chat as well. Um, if you are a featured speaker, we have two. Um, your time limit is slightly different. You have between 20 and 30 minutes. You're welcome to finish sooner if you like, but you have slightly more time. Um, and regular speakers, of which we also have to have 15 minutes. So I will be giving you um, a two minute warning right before your time runs out. I will, I'm very sorry, I will interrupt you um, and just let you know. Um, and for the audience, if I could please ask you to keep yourselves muted unless you are the speaker or unless you have been called upon to ask a question at the end. This is just to make sure there are no disruptions and nobody gets distracted. Um, and like I said, we will break after hopefully an hour and 45 minutes, give you a few minutes break, and then we will be reconvening at this link for um, panel 2B, which is dwelling in the archive, and that takes place at 4 p.m. British summer time. Um, and it'll be in this very meeting on this very link. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite our first speaker, um, our featured speaker, who is Professor Amina Yakin of the University of Exeter. And she will be talking to us about her new book, which is called Gender, Sexuality and Feminism in Pakistani Urdu Writing. Hello. Um... Hello, uh, can you all hear me and see me? <laughs> okay, fine. Hi everyone, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Adab, it's good to be here. Thank you so much and thank you very much to the Tasavru Collective, uh, especially a uh, shout out to Fatima for all the excellent work <laughs> that she's been doing and, um, and for, um, you know, also going beyond, above and beyond the call of duty by sorting out um, biographies and abstracts when people like me are too lazy to send um, things in. So thank you so much, Fatma. And um, I would, um, you said at the start, I mean, this is uh, such an exciting conference, an exciting concept and a much needed one. So I'm also um, looking forward to fellow panelists and listening to papers. Um, as much as I can into the recordings. And I think one of the things that you said, if there's anything that will um, be uh, of like a questionable content or whatever that people might feel worried about. I didn't think that my book was really like that, but yesterday when I was out <laughs> for an, uh, just meeting with some friends and um, I, before I start this story, I actually need to show you my PowerPoint as well. So shall I share my screen? Is that okay? Um, see that and do I need to do something we can see everything yeah uh, I can't see anything can you see it okay yeah it's up now it was just loading uh, that that's the this my talk today is based on my book gender sexuality and feminism in Urdu writing so I'll try and summarize as much as I can uh, in 20 minutes and um, I was showing the cover of the book to um, my friends and they were concerned that I was going to publish the book with the same title in Pakistan and with the same cover. And uh, and I think the name Salman Rushdie came up in connection to it. And I just, um, I was a bit surprised. I said, well, the publisher in Pakistan is, is quite happy to publish it. And I really don't think the content is anything in the same uh, way that uh, it would be of a concern or an issue, but they, 
thought that it might uh, be u usable as something that somebody would create, um, could create a fuss over or an issue over. Anyway, I, I don't think it will happen. So uh, I just thought it was interesting to have that conversation because the image that you have there is from Naisa Khan's um, Henna Hands, which she very kindly lent for the book. And uh, she and I have a connection with Urdu poetry. So I think that's what sort of brought us together. So this project has been a long time in the making, as it were, and it's something uh, that I've thought about very deeply. In fact, my younger daughter laughs at me and says that she will never become an academic because if it took me 20 years to write this book, she really doesn't think it's a, it's a good use of my time. I, I did kind of stop and do several other projects in the middle, and I'm quite glad that I went back to it and, um, and did some things that I wasn't able to do in the first part. So it's, it, it's very much um based on the 20th century and the uh, legacy of the 20th century feminist poets urdu poets in pakistan that we have and that i think it's it's an important moment to kind of go back to that history and think about that history and what that history gives us with uh, regards to the both the women's movement as well as developments in urdu literature and more broadly kind of national contexts as well as transnational um ideas of um, gender, sexuality and feminism. So I think any um, any project like this has to define its relationship to Urdu um, as it begins. And this book is very much about poetry, politics and women. And I think in India and in Pakistan and South Asia more broadly, poetry connects a multiplicity of voices in the public domain, appealing to an elite class. And it also extends beyond that kind of ashrafization in its formulation as an everyday lived experience. And in fact, um, a barrister was saying this to me who practices in Pakistan um, and is an English um, barrister. And he said, suddenly, the, the kind of lawyers will break into couplets and there'll be a in the court. And he's kind of always found that a little bit um, difficult or challenging to, to deal with. So it's, it's kind of present everywhere, really. Um, and you'll find in terms of its everyday usage on um, discussion, you know, on rickshaws, on the back of rickshaws, television channels, everything. So uh, and the, you've got also cultural forms such as devotional music, Gavali, folk art, street theater, which are engaging a cross section of society. And you've got sort of really through that kind of language. I mean, the point about there really is about the language and what kind of symbols, metaphors and uh, personifications are being overturned and what kinds of class politics are being questioned through the deployment of that kind of language. So in that sort of landscape, it's quite important to think about the place of women and their intersectional relations to um, class, nation, and culture, and there are <clears throat> a, a very uh, there is very good work going on at the moment in, on plural diversities of poetic knowledges in South Asia, and a decolonized approach to poetry through a region-led cross-cultural knowledge of poetic traditions, and and in fact that's something that I would sort of also like to do as the next uh, that I am working on as the next part of this project, so. You know, how do we then make sense of the different types of narratives that are embedded in those politics of conformity and resistance? So if, to, to really get to the bottom of that, you then go back to Urdu's relationship. Um, I mean, there are many relationships. You can go back to um, the, the kind of idea of Urdu as the language of the camps that developed as a lingua franca. Um, historically, or you can go back to the exalted language Urdu and Mola associated with the Mughals who came to prominence in the middle to late 18th century, at the same time as the ousting of Persian from the courts by the British. So you've got sort of lots of layers of how Urdu develops and is considered. And then you've got sort of administratively in terms of the language of power and um, uh, in, in, in the kind of law courts. Um, you've got administration and judiciary using that and uh, especially in the northern state of Punjab, the British imposed English and Urdu as the languages of government. And I put two images there, you know, obviously of, of the of um, the Queen um, Elizabeth at the time, who was um, sorry, Victoria, I'm getting confused between my queens um, <laughs> and uh, the. Uh, 
Shamsul Ulama um, Award that used to be given out, and I wanted to just pick that out particularly because a poet who I uh, refer to and talk about in my book, who is a male poet, but who has um, a very important um, connection to how gender develops in Urdu poetry, Altaf Hussein Hali, and especially how the language of the Ghazal is reformed under his leadership and also Azad, Molana Azad's kind of um, interventions. So he was given that particular recognition and award, as well as another writer that I refer to who's a prose writer, who's, uh, who's again a male writer who influences the development of um, of how women stories are imagined and read in Urdu, and that is Nazir Ahmed, who is um, uh, some famously uh, the story of um, Asghari and Akbari, the two daughters, um, the good girl and the bad girl, if I want to put it very simply, of um, the aspirational kind of uh, morality that was projected through those two characterizations of Akbari and Asghari through um, Nazir Ahmed's novels lives with us to this day in um, Pakistani culture and I think also in Indian culture in terms of what women are expected, how women are expected to behave and perform duty and um, identity. And he was also uh, given the title of Shamsul Ulama and he also um, wrote specifically for a female audience because books at that time uh, uh, the British did encourage, they did want, you know, the Zanana was um, a place that was a place of mystery and a place that they wanted to kind of dig deeper into to get um, closer knowledge of the um, uh, kind of place that they were colonizing. And uh, that was the way to the Zanana was quite complex and was mediated through many people, including women and men. So uh, the role that male writers played and that was quite interesting and it's um, so I think you know for me that's also part of the intersectional analysis that I represent in this book when I get to the story of the um, pioneering feminist poets such as Kishwa Nahi and Femi Dariaz um, I in order to tell their stories and and also others before them I have I kind of felt it necessary to map this this historical journey so that um, there is a uh, measured understanding of how gender is changing and sex ideas of sexuality are being um, maneuvered and developed over time. So you've got um, Urdu as a language of love, you know, associated with the form of the ghazal very much, uh, the love lyric. And uh, within the love lyric, you've got a particular type of gendering that takes place around the lover and the beloved. And uh, again, you've got this as part of an Islamic heritage from um, a, a very strong heritage from the Persian tradition. So, um, and as well as the pre-Islamic tradition of uh, the ghazal literally being um, a kind of a small part of a poem, uh, which was um, understood as something that meant talking to women. So it's, it's a kind of fascinating story about it that many people would be familiar with, with, but over time, you know, it becomes encapsulated in a particular form. And uh, what happens, uh, especially in the 19th century, is that the ghazal is reformed. It is felt that the ghazal has got um, a little bit too much of an erotic feel to it. And it's also the intervention of a kind of realism and reality um, approach within the kind of prose tradition. So you've got those um, multiple contact zones and Islamic and Indic influences. And you've also got Rehti, the tradition of Rehti in Urdu. So the point I also make is about Urdu's contact zones as it travels from the south in the Dakkan to the north in India and becomes kind of the language, uh, the heartland of UP and of Delhi, you know, how do we understand this kind of north-south um, journey of Urdu and what impact does it have and how it gets gendered? So is, as it moves northwards, it gets more and more kind of, um, I suppose, masculinized in certain ways. And, and um, other kind of scholars, um, Carla Petrovich's work on this is quite interesting. Um, and I think the alongside that, you've got the politicization of language and community and 
the rise of Muslim nationalism. And you can't discount that um, within this, this story because Urdu increasingly you know, becomes a language of minoritization. So that in itself has um, an influence in how it um, is thought of and is developed. And for me, I think the secular, the idea of the secular was something that um, was very present within the secular and the devotion, particularly in the devotional Sufi representations, which have a noteworthy influence on Urdu writers. And you've got the, for example, the feminine voice in Sufi poetry and how the nafs, the soul, is connected to feminine traits, although it can also allude to vice and temptation. So you've got sort of all these things in the background. And then you've got the colonial archive and the first woman with a published divan, collection of ghazals, uh, from the Dakkan region by the name of Malaka Baichanda. <clears throat> and uh, she was a performer at the Nizam of Hyderabad's court. And in 1799, she presented her book of songs to the resident of Hyderabad, John Malcolm, who then, you know, that's how we have an archive of it at the British Library. The fate of a fallen woman such as Malaka, along with the aesthetics of courtesan culture, really, uh, why I... Um, have kind of emphasized it and why I have included this in my narrative or in this book is when I interviewed one of the key poets that I wanted to um, to study in, in this book, uh, Zehra Nega, who is a major Urdu poet of the 20th century. And one of the things she mentioned in my in her interview with in one of her initial interviews with me was uh, the relationship she had uh, to the performance, the performance of her poetry. So because um, Urdu poetry and the poetry symposium, it's a very performative tradition and traditionally women uh, were not in the public sphere. So once they are in the public sphere and uh, they start performing poetry, it takes a very different kind of shade than it has had before. So for her, that, that kind of um, comparison with Malaka Baichanda or the courtesan culture always comes into play around the performativity of herself uh, as a poet, although she's a recognized and a respected poet. But it was also something that she would hear mentioned to her from her kind of contemporaries or somebody who was senior to her. So I think there's a very uh, complex relationship that the po women poets have had to negotiate. And despite this book is also telling the story of these poets from the progressive angle, because they are sort of part of the 1930s progressive writers movement. And um, it is uh, really important that Urdu prose kind of broke a lot of barriers, you know, with people like Isma Chukhtai, Rashid Jahan, and the other pioneers. It broke a lot of barriers in terms of what women could write about and also what men could write about in terms of sexuality, in terms of um, realism. But then uh, when it became more of, um, once you get to poetry, you have less kind of of a public presence when it comes to women poets, and you get that more in the post-1947 period. So you have somebody like, for instance, the poet Ada Jafri, who makes the journey from India to Pakistan, but she is someone who wasn't allowed to go to school uh, because you know the education for her as a kind of Sharif uh, woman had to happen in her home. She couldn't go into the public sphere. And it's once she moves to Pakistan and then settles and gets married here that she kind of, that whole thing that whole kind of identity changes for her. So even though the poetry, you know, in, in terms of its kind of uh, content might not be radical in the way that we read the more radicalized writings of a poet like Femi Darias later on, I think it's still, you know, that initial, those initial journeys, those initial changes, that they were quite major in those days. Uh, so it's, something that I think it's for me going back to the Malaka Baichanda story it is something that keeps coming back for the women poets and it's also kind of related to the culture of um, the performing arts 
And I think Urdu poets, because of that performativity of the form, become sort of associated or have very strong links with that. So um, the, <clears throat> I mean, I've talked to you quite a lot about the Zanana and the kind of public life. And to sum up, really, in the colonial state, the Zanana was a target for reform and knowledge of the other and a shift from a Parda-based elite class to women's political presence in public life. And what you have with the progressive writers' movement is you have a very strong influence of communism, of psychoanalysis, of anti-fascism, and of sexuality. Uh, so the aim to connect literature with community and introduce new subjectivities, including gender and class, is something that is kind of turning conventional narratives about women into a new kind of place. So when you get to Pakistan, uh, what I also, a big sort of, this book looks at, at that uh, sacred and secular and how they are um, connect, uh, connected and disconnected within the narratives of these poets. You've got the legacies of Muhammad Ali Jannah and Muhammad Iqbal, you know, already you've got the sort of sacred slash secular ideologies that form the nation and around which people will um, identify or um, construct certain ideas of nationhood. So you've also then got to think about the influence of the jamaat -e islami and, and the kind of rise of the right, the distrust of the West, the Islamism, Cold War politics, and the closure of the left. So what happens to the left in Pakistan is important uh, to this book as well. And um, while you have that kind of, and I won't go into the kind of detailed history because we don't have time for it, but the women's movement and the protest marches, and particularly the 1980s, I think are hugely important for these poets because they are activists as well. And you have the introduction of the Hadood ordinances in the 1980s, and you have a, a, a Sharia law that is being enforced and implemented and being enacted on the bodies of women. And you have, you know, you see that picture from one of the marches and, you know, at a time when women were being kettled and beaten up and also the rise of poetry, resistance poetry played a big part in sort of bringing that sense of community and people together. And of course, there were uh, Habib Jaleb, the poet that people will um, associate quite a lot because of the anthem of the women's movement came from him. But he was also propped up by somebody like Gish Kishwa Nahid, or at, you know, at least that's her claim. So I think there's so many kind of interconnected stories in terms of how they played a part in terms of the um, changing um, changing kind of um, landscape of poetry and how then what you have is this really strong cultural nationalism that is being enforced onto women's bodies and the identity of the woman in Pakistan and then you have the new Pakistani woman being imagined by these poets who's thinking through those burdens of honor and shame and thinking through those sexualities and thinking about sort of shifting language and changing that. So, so these are kind of some pictures of some of the poets that I talk about, Femi the Riyaz, Kishwa Nahid, um, uh, Ada Jafri, that's Rashid Jahan, uh, Parveen Shakir, um, <clears throat> Sara Shagufta. And uh, they're all very different kinds of poets. And Zehra Nagai, I, I don't know how much time I have. So I, I'm not going to read the poems, but I'm just going to uh, put them up on the screen so you can see. I've, I've just picked out uh, one poem from her, Samjota, which is about the Chadar. And I think that is such a huge symbol, you know, from the way we think about the hijab today to the way that the Chadar has been a part of South Asian lives for a very long time, and the idea of Parda. And um, I think all of those things get encapsulated in that poem, but also, and I'm really sorry about those bullets on the side. That's, I don't know how that happened. Um, but um, it's, I think it's so important that poem in terms of what it captures, you know, in terms of her sensibility and her voice. She has a quite a, strong kind of activism in her poetry but this is the more this, this is the kind of gentler 
voice that she uses and that she deploys in terms of her representation and the questions that she's asking within that. And, and um, she's alive um, to this day and we're lucky to have her still in Pakistan. And I think also it's important to note that she was kind of this 16 year old sensation who was doing these Mushaira performances and, and she laughs and you know tells stories about how when she performed at, um, at a kind of wet, alongside men in a me, in a women's college it was the men who had to be put in further so you know it's someone who can laugh about it as well at the same time um, and then she stopped writing when she got married you know for a very long time she didn't write at all so when I represent these poets and I talk about their work I also talk about their personal lives because I think they they're important to think about in terms of how um, the overall narrative does is allowed to be developed and shaped and how those kind of ideas have an impact on what they do. And she came under the tutelage of Fares Ahmed Fares quite a lot who um, had a strong influence. And then a kind of very well-known poem, Fahmi the Riaz, who um, uh, my chapter's A Woman Impure, and uh, she has, uh, you know, a huge, all of them have a huge body of work and um, I've got some kind of images of some of her books there, Femi Dariaz. Also, you know, she's a migrant from uh, India and uh, from pre-partition India, and she settled in Karachi. And she has a very strong relationship to a kind of multilingual um, sensibility within Pakistan. But she also wrote uh, the book Badan Darida, The Body Torn, which create, caused a lot of controversy and all, was she you know made it difficult for her to be accepted by the urdu literati because she broke taboos and she wrote about well she wrote about things like uh, this particular poem zabano kabosa you know kissing uh, with tongues I and mean, we don't really talk about that in urdu do you uh, she wrote about menstruation she wrote about uh, she wrote about intimacy she wrote about sexuality she wrote about the body even in terms of when she's talking about a woman laughing you know there's a particular kind of um freedom to her that is not available to women at that um in in those contexts so i think she and certainly within the way that they're talked about within urdu there's a very strong uh, language code a linguistic code that is applied which is embedded within kind of Sharif codes of behavior. So if you step outside those codes of behavior, you know, it's, it's a big problem because then you become, you know, an influence that is problematic and that must, you know, cannot be allowed into the canon. And it's really interesting because then if you go back to the progressives and you look at the history of the progressives, you also see that sexuality was something uh, that the British state also, uh, the colonial state also intervened in a little bit when they were, you know, uh, doing all those uh, maneuverings over the um, banning of Angare in UP, the book, the collection of short stories by the progressives. So, so I think it's uh, in, in the book, I trace that I, I kind of go back uh, to that story and try to link that to the present to say, well, what is it, you know, where it, it's not that the Urdu literati suddenly you know, becomes like this within Pakistan. What are the longer connections here? How can we think about this <clears throat> differently? So then, um, I mean, moving very rapidly on to other poets, when I was doing this book, I was, um, I, I spoke to a lot of men and uh, because a lot of men are part of the Urdu establishment and uh, they were very helpful. I also spoke to a lot of women writers. And, and I have to say, everybody was very welcoming and everybody was very helpful, but everybody also had a very clear idea about how my book should be written. So I think that's why it took me such a long time to write this book. I was like, okay, I do have a vision and I do have an argument, but I keep being told that this is the argument about feminism in Pakistan or the writing that I must present. So um, Barveen Shakir was somebody who, um, I mean, a book that influenced me quite a lot was Ruxana Ahmed's translations of um, these women poets, which came out in 1991 in, in Britain. It was all, also published here. It was called We Sinful Women. She used the title of Kishra Nahid's poem Ham Gunahgar Orte as her title. And um, it was also published by Asr in, in Pakistan. Um, and in the introduction to that, uh, Ruxana said that, uh, you know, she had a 
very particular. She herself is a you know playwright, a writer, translator, kind of a huge figure in Britain. Um, so it was interesting because she had a very specific idea of feminism that she was talking about in her introduction, and she was also very categorical that she didn't want to include Parveen Shakir in that kind of uh, coterie of women that she included as part of the feminist Urdu tradition. So for me, it was an interesting um, thing to challenge and to look up and also to be able to think through in terms of when I came to write my book, well, how do you... And I think this particular poem that I've got here captures that um, dilemma that she had with the way that she was thought about and the way that she... She was essentially represented very much as a romantic poet and she you know, she had two PhDs, she worked in the civil service, she was a single woman, uh, and, and she tragically died in a car crash at a young age. So she's, and, and she was very pretty as well. So there was um, a particular kind of way that she's read, you know, in a, in a very romantic, in a very um, interesting way. So I think in this book, I wanted to open up other ways of reading Parveen Shakir as well. And she also spoke up in defense of um, another poet who is actually slightly outside the middle class milieu that I'm um, engaging with here. And it's hard, believe me, it's hard to find a lot of uh, poets in that period who are being published and who are representing uh, voices that are not kind of coming out of that middle class Sharif tradition. So Sarah Shugufta was one oh, particular poet. Two minute warning. Yeah. Am I nearly oh, at the end? Two yeah, minutes. That's oh, sorry. Fine. Two minutes. No, 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 that's fine. I'm nearly finished. So she wrote about Sara Shagufta as well, uh, Parveen Shakir, but she was seen, Sara Shagufta was very much also a, a poet who was read for her personal life in terms of her relationships. And uh, women's relationships have always played a very strong part in the way that they've been read by the literati. Um, but Sara Shagufta particularly, and and also she, um, you know, she was treated for um, mental illness in an asylum, and she was, uh, I suppose you've got a bit of a Plath kind of, Sel Sylvia Plath likeness, and uh, the way that the treatment of electric shocks and things like that, uh, but also, you know, not, not being understood, not being heard, and the way, the kind of poetry that she re read wasn't valued, uh, wrote wasn't valued, because it was a very different kind of um, voice that she was kind of coming out with. But anyway, this is a poem from her collection, and Parveen Shakir wrote in her defense as well, a particular poem. So the last poet that I look at is Kishwa Nahid, and uh, she, this is her kind of body of work. And she's um, seen as in, in different ways by different critics. And she herself says that people call her a na aurat, a not woman, because they feel threatened by unconventional woman. I mean, she's, she's quite a big force. I, I think she's somebody to be reckoned with. And she had quite a big stature because of her work that she did in civil service. Uh, but yeah, that particular ghazal that I've got there, I think, gives you an in inclination of how she feels she is read as a female poet. And uh, she, you know, puts herself in the subject as as a woman, which is different to what the ghazal would normally do. Um, because, you know, the gender is ambivalent and it could be anyone. But in this case, it's her. And then this is an extract from her poem. But I'll just very quickly kind of go to uh, the ending, which is where do we go next with the story? And you've had this kind of Aurat March, uh, where, which has come back into play, I think, in, since 2018, and picked up uh, the women's movement in a very different way with a diff new generation and a different context and the secular sacred divide that I've been talking about through these 20th century poets, you know, is heading in a different direction, in a new direction under the Aurat March. And um, in um, what, what was the secular sac sacred divide in the 20th century Pakistan is not what it is now. And I think it's interesting because then you have this, what's happened in through the Aurat March is that a poet like Gishwa Nahid has been seen to be out of date because her aspirations, her language and her concerns don't always match up with the kind of rights and conversation that the new generation wants to talk about. So I think there's a, there's a fascinating kind of three generations of feminists that are 
uh, that we need to think about and cross in, in the way we imagine them. And I think where I'd like to sort of see Urdu going, or where I, sorry, not where I'd like to see Urdu going, where Urdu is going next, I think, is towards a more gritty urban uh, narrative, which is, I think, contextualized by someone like Eva B, who is a rap artist uh, based in Layari in Karachi, a uh, kind of working class area, a very poor area, uh, where you have kind of gangland drug culture. And she's uh, you know, coming from an African Baloch community. And I think when you have those kind of multilingualisms within Urdu, and you have those um, different kind of hybridities, which Urdu has always had traditionally, and it gets out of the kind of gatekeeper um, realm, then, then you have some exciting times ahead for where feminist voices and gender and sexualities will go in the 21st century. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was just making notes and writing down questions the whole time, but hopefully we will be able to get to that um, at the end of the panel. So lots of really incredible ideas here. And it's really interesting, actually, that you started with um, the these ideas of Islamic aid, and you were talking about courtesan culture and how the impact that it has on Urdu poetry, because our next speaker is actually um, going to be talking, maybe springing up from that and talk about something a little bit different. But our next speaker is Neha Shaji, who is a PhD student at the University of Bristol. And she will today be talking to us about um, Islamic Age, the queer potentiality of the cinematic courtesan. Um, and I will be sharing slides for you. So give me half a second and we can do that. Can everyone see that? Hiya. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? All good? Yeah, we can. Uh, fantastic. Uh, just, just, just want to say thank you to Fatima and Sheila and Zera for organizing this absolutely f f f fantastic um, symposium. Um, also, just a wee note that I always put at the beginning, I do, 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 do have a stutter. So, um, if anything isn't um, isn't very clear, please do feel free to um, just pop it in the chat or uh, ask during the Q and A, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to clarify. So let's get in. Um, so I'm just going to be talking today a little bit about the queer potentiality of the cinematic courtesan. So several several famous um, real life courtesans were involved in the earlier days. Um, of the Indian film and music industries. Uh, for instance, Gohar Jan, who um, recorded the first Indian s s s song, or Zubeda Begum, who starred in India's first, um, say, talkie film. Um, but ironically, as these film and music industries uh, grew in prominence um, and availability, the course songs were no longer the primary sources of um, popular entertainment and um, for a number of reasons, including the uh, colonial and post-colonial uh, governments um, labeling the courtesan as being technically illegal, um, the courtesan had prime was then immortalized in Indian cinema. And I guess that's what the focus of my work today is, um, this embalmed reconstructed figure who I read as dynamic and queer, um, as opposed to a stagnant, I guess, uh, crystallization of the historical uh, pr 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 profession. So disruptive both um, cinematically and politically, the courtesan's uniqueness, I guess, is the in the beaut be be beautification of uh, negative effect, the presentation of death, failure and loss as accepted, desired, and um, and lived alongside. I utilize the term queered in my title and oftentimes throughout the presentation to 
um, emphasize the difference between this reconstruction and the and the and the and the actual historical courtesan. Uh, Fatima, could we go to the next thingy? Thank you. So this figure serves as a rupture in m m m moralistic constructions of um, womanhood relationships and s s sexual transgression. So essentially, I situate the courtesan sort of dis 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 discomfittingly within the discipline of queer theory, um, where previous critical work around the figure acknowledges her, 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 her sexual transgressiveness, but um, does not explicitly define her as queer. So the courtesan here, is, the cinematic courtesan here, is studied as an assemblage rather than a single um, singular entity. And that allows for differences, I guess, between the depictions and avoids reducing the character to a trope. Um, and I'm using the term assemblage that, 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 that I just mentioned. Um, and I'm using it as described by Just Be Poor, where temporal narratives of progression are upturned and queerness is becoming rather than being. Um, and as such, the court sounds disruptive nature. Um, as studied in this paper is not rooted in fixity. Um, she's queer in different ways at different times in different films. So yeah, um, queer in this reading takes several forms, resistive, d -d 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 disruptive, fragmented, imperfect. It's a methodology rather than a prescriptive identity. Um, it's the modes of living outside normativity as opposed to a certain identity one exists as. Um, I'll be looking at world making through world altering in order to highlight the need for awareness um, as to how the queer courtesan is to be somewhat direct at the at risk for homo nationalist interpretations in post section 377 um, Hindu nationalist India, yet also illustrate the character's queer potential. So I'll be talking about two films here, um, Kamala Mrohi's Pakiza, starring Meena Kumari, um, one of the most famous and earlier, um, earliest films that did, 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 did defined the archetype, which tells the story of a courtesan trapped in her quota, literally, li literally and metaphorically, who falls in love with a stranger who sees her on a train. Uh, Pakiza is as traditional as you can get when looking at courtesan cinema, embodying the... Did, 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 the, 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 the beautiful, the beautified tragedy of the of the genre. Um, secondly, I look at the far more recent Deidishkia, which can very loosely be de 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 described as more of a heist film, uh, which revolves around a stolen necklace. Deidishkia um, is chosen here due to the heavy narrative implication of Madhuri Dixit's uh, Begum Para being simultaneously queer, Muslim, and a former dancing girl. Both films are heavily influenced by Islamic legacies, Pakistan throughout and Deidishkia selectively. Um, the latter also carries several references uh, towards Ismet Chuktai's Lihaf. Uh, could we have the next slide, uh, slide please? Thank you. Um, both these films have a historically ambiguous environment to varying extents. The Islamic legacies are d distinct and apparent in the costuming and architectural uh, setting of settings of Pakiza, um, manifestly drawing from an amalgamation of the Mughal and colonial eras. In the Adishkia, the Begum's palace and garden seem to be set somewhat in the past aesthetically, linguistically, and even at times narratively. Well, the film is definitely set in the extreme contemporary, j -j 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 just like the, origi uh, the original Ishkia, the royal house disrupts this. Uh, and the, 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 that becomes a confusing incongruity that has the effect of making the palace feel like it exists outside time. And both films prioritize the ornamental over the explicit or the functional to depict this in, 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 in indeterminate figure that revels in its historical and sexual ambivalence. Uh, so the chronological stillness of the course sun's domain is what makes it um, somewhat prison-like um, to um, to, to, to the viewer. Richard Allen states that um, and borrows Mikhail Baxin's term, Pakis that highlights and defines the unique chronotope of the historical courtesan genre, that is the discrete space time of the um, discrete space time of the courtesan's world that is disjoined from the space of the world outside and from the temporal logic of the modern 
romance narrative that calls for the liberation of the courtesan from the prison house of the Kota and into the chronological future-oriented time um, and the expansive spatial horizons of the romance narrative. But in Pakiza, Saib Jan's existence in, a, in this you know, so-called chronological future-oriented time is not shown to be a fairy tale existence. Amrohi's blurring of boundaries with constant glimpses of the multitudes that watch Saib Jan dance is simultaneous with her extreme discomfort in public spaces due to be being recognized um, recognized for her profession. In Dedishkia, the only major character that seems to not once step into modernity throughout the majority of the film is Madri Dixit's Begumbara. Uh, and when she finally does, it is towards the end of the film as, um, as she escapes the historicized environment. Both characters here, both both courtesans here, um, courtesan archetypes here, are separated from society and exist almost solely within their constructed prisons, as uh, as uh, t -t 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 timeless and unlocatable as the as the enclosures themselves. The um, historical nostalgia evoked by the temporality of the traditional courtesan film is explicit and is pre 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 present in many other. Um, incarnations of the figure, such as Umrao Jan and Kalank, which maintain their aesthetic ambivalence, even when based on a historical narrative and a defined p -p 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 point in time. Could we have the next slide, please. Thank you. It's an ode to a bygone era emphasized by the reality that um, courtesan culture in India is now present only through cinema. It's this uh, nostalgia for an unfettered pre-colonial existence um, exalted by writers such as Dev Dutt Patnaik, a combination of Sufi romanticism and the permitted transgressions of sexuality and gender in, hin in Hindu mythology. Yet yeah, that, um, and that, that, that is, which, which is a problematic point of view as placing the courtesan in this nostalgically atemporal yet incontestably um, not contemporary results in two outcomes. Uh, firstly, by placing the explicitly queered courtesan, the one that revels in death and rejects notions of futurity in an unlocatable past, the films distance themselves from taking a stance on either the courtesan or queerness themselves. They do not place the sexually transgressive uh, heroine in um, post-colonial India, where successive governments and freedom fighters brought in anti-notch laws to disassociate themselves from um, Orientalist uh, perspectives and, and enact gender-based violence on, on, on um, existing courts at the time. Uh, secondly, however, to historicize David Bell's uh, phrase, there's also a bit of uh, temporal queer re-territorialization taking place. The evident Islamic legacies and the acceptance of um, quote unquote respectable sexual transgression has to be considered alongside um, what Ruth Vanita calls the simultaneous and contradictory myths that m m Muslims introduced homosexuality into India or re uh, re repressed its expression. And these are contradicting myths that exist in tandem and can be seen throughout um, throughout Indian media. The courtesan is an empowering figure, but the strictures she transgresses against are implied in both films to be rigidly Islamic in nature. And her goal then in, is to escape from them. In both Pakiza and the Dishkia, Saib Jan and Begum Bada's story ends with the escape outside the historical, they go outside the historical enclosure and into what is presumed to be a modern, contemporary, and 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 accepting wider society. So yeah, that that escape, the courtesan's escape from the Islamic film, is framed as empowering. Uh, can next slide, please. So in the Dishkia, filmed in the period um, of continued li li litigation around Section three seven seven in India forces us to return to Ruth Vanita's delineation of the myths, um, as, I, as I said earlier, on that Muslims 
both introduced homosexuality into India as well as repressed it. So for Begum, Bara and Munia, running away from the historicized environment um, enveloped in re 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 repression is in the film, the key to their happiness. Thinking about it in purely gendered terms, the narrative, the narrative simply moves towards a very straightforward queer feminist goal. However, when considering the environment the film was released into, it's just as important to consider not just what the courtesan is running towards, but what she's running from. So both films end, um, as I've mentioned just now, um, with an escape as the utopian happy ending. Um, and there is silence about what happens to the characters outside the pre-colonial Islamic environment because the assumption is, of course, they're happy because Indian society is absolutely perfect um, outside of that enclosure. Yet the courtesan as a uniquely disruptive um, archetype within Indian cinema has had um, and continues to have immense p -p 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 potential. She's situated firmly in history, placing a reconstructed character um, into cinematic memory of as having always belonged there. And with this Sorry, homoerotic- Two minute warning. Sorry. No worries, nearly done. With this uh, homoeroticization of uh, topography through reconstructions of this ambiguous past, uh, chronological borders can be augmented. The queerness that is present within the constraints of the enclosure can then be extrapolated to happen throughout the film, but it's off, quite often it's not done. This paper has discussed how Khorsan cinema is not exempt from the strictures of Indian popular cinema's um, emphasis on heteronormative morality and nationalist fundamentalism, but, ra um, but rather that it encourages uh, the, the, the depictions of sexuality that navigate these boundaries with the aim of disrupting them. Um, you know, in Cruising Utopia refers to the anticipatory illumination of certain objects which are utopian in their illustration of potentiality and in their, in their ability to do that. And I read the cinematic courtesan as utopian in this way, which is why it's, be, it's, it's, it's important to be very aware of how she is presented in, in films, in contemporary films. Her disruptive, amorphous, um, intersection, inter, 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 intersecting positionality is precisely what makes the figures susceptible to her revisionist myths of the nation, to narratives engendering the idea that her oppression was purely an Islam, um, was purely and exclusively due, 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 due to Islamic ideas of morality. Perhaps the Gordon's agency, so often coming with the caveat that it's used that it is only used to quite literally run away from India's um, Islamic legacies, is what prevents her from finding the utopian queer future she deserves. Uh, thank you. I hope I'm, I was on time. You absolutely were. Thank you so much. I'm going to. OK, we all back. OK, thank you so much, Neha, for that. Um, lots of really great ideas. I loved your summary of um, Dear Dishkia. It is truly a heist film more than anything else. Um, so I think it's interesting that you talked about um, the phrase you use specifically that I really like was methodology rather than prescriptive identity and the way that you were you know, connecting those dots. And it's interesting because our next speaker um, looks at these sort of simultaneous identity markers and these different methodological um, methods in, in a slightly different way. Um, I'm sorry, we were planning to give a break in between, but we're tight on time. So we'd rather give you a break afterwards so that you can kind of go and do, do your thing. So our next speaker um, is Professor Shireen B.S. from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. And she will be talking to us about, um, she will be giving a paper based off her book, uh, Gendering Minorities. Um, and uh, it's gonna be really interesting. So Shireen, do you, um, would you like to share your screen for your materials or are you, um, or would you like to give them to me? Um, I don't have slides, just to be That's fine. Sure. That's fine, that's perfect.
afternoon. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I hope I'm audible. It's it's a little unclear, but we can hear you. Maybe it'll get better. Yeah, I think that Thank you very much, and I, I really appreciate uh, the organization uh, of this uh, conference at a very pertinent time. It's so important that this happens at this particular point in salvation history. Uh, yeah, so uh, without taking much time, th thank you, Fatima, and the other organizers. And um, yeah, uh, so to begin with, I will be, as uh, uh, mentioned, I'll be talking about my book, uh, Gender Minorities, Muslim Women and the Politics of Modernity. Uh, yeah, in fact, I just have a couple of visuals once uh, the book cover itself. Which is and uh, uh, this book actually is a project that uh, I started along with my PhD thesis and then um, it took me almost 10 years to materialize and to bring it out as a book. Um, and uh, uh, when I kind of uh, started my research, it was uh, uh, my idea was to look into the rather unknown history of Muslim women from the south of India, particularly Kerala, where uh, I come from. Uh, and uh, what is interesting about Muslim women's history and writing literature and uh, political engagement from this region is that Urdu is not a language which is used by Muslims uh, uh, from this part of the country. And they use the uh, local regional language, Malayalam, which is the language of the people of Kerala. And prior to 19th century, or even like towards the end of 19th till like early uh, mid 19th century, Muslims in Kerala were using another script called Arabic Malayalam. And they were, there were literature both in Arabic Malayalam and in Malayalam, which were like um, written by, published by, and used by, read by Muslims uh, of Kerala. And uh, the, the particular uh, writings that I am kind of uh, trying to discuss here, uh, some of them uh, were kind of uh, writings published by Muslim women, women as publishers, I mean, uh, not just as writers, but there were publishers among Muslim women in early 20th century Kerala. And uh, they were running their own small publishing houses and were engaging with questions related to uh, women in general, the idea of community, the idea of faith, the idea of religion, etc. What I'm going to do right now is uh, to give you a kind of uh, an overview of the book. Um, in terms of what I'm trying to do in the book and what are the arguments, major arguments in the book. And then um, in the last part of my uh, presentation, probably I would want to uh, focus on a particular section, which is uh, uh, precisely on these journals, journals published by uh, Muslim women for um, a large uh, uh, chunk of readership. Uh, from among the Muslims of Kerala. And this, uh, these journals were uh, like, they were, uh, their circulation was not that great, but then they were like widely circulated among Muslims of the uh, region. And uh, uh, like uh, we had these uh, journals and little magazines and journals from different parts of the country during that period, um, talking about different kinds of things. This particular thing was, uh, this, these particular journals were engaging with the question of religion and faith. And uh, that was a very, a very crucial moment in the history of uh, Islam in India because the uh, largely the national context partition was happening. So the, a lot of political questions re related to the minority identity and Muslim um, uh, reality that those were coming up at that time. And then the, these journals situated them, themselves among the reform context where people were talking in terms of 
women's empowerment. Um, uh, if you're familiar with the Bengal context and the um, now famous uh, proposition by Bharti Chatterjee, the idea of nationalist resolution of the women's question. Uh, so in that context, how uh, do community try to look at the question of gender, nationalism, identity, etc., in a very in, in a totally different plane, I would say. So that will be the um, a little part of uh, what I will be doing. Um, uh, yeah, so the book uh, in general is basically, uh, I call these enterprises, feminist enterprises by Muslim women from Kerala. And I feel that uh, at various historical genders, they had a complex set of negotiations uh, uh, with their religious and cultural identities. So the book begins by... Uh, 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 the, the active participation of Muslim women um, in the establishment of Islam or in the uh, spread of Islam in the southern part of the country, uh, the, the role of uh, Muslim women and as Sufis, as uh, um, 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 uh, Features as uh, proponents of the religion. So, in that sense, uh, uh, the first chapter focuses on a, a, a few regions in Kerala where we have Muslim settlements and conversion was uh, uh, quite dynamic um, uh, during the um, uh, 18th, 19th centuries. And uh, uh, what I aim to look at, uh, what I have uh, arrived at from my uh, engagement with these communities by situating the this community, these com um, 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 by looking at um, uh, the, the Muslim um, religious uh, units in these areas, what I have seen is there is a large kind of um, um, uh, there are these large settlements of Muslims especially near the coastal regions and uh, where uh, there is a kind of um, uh, the, the conversion as a phenomenon was quite uh, um, uh, uh, there is a participation of women women as preachers in this process of conversion and uh, what is quite inspiring or like for what was quite fascinating for me to uh, uh, see was that, especially in the southern part of Kerala, there is a mosque called Bhima Palli. And this mosque is in the name of a woman, uh, Sophie Singh. Uh, and she, uh, I think a lot, lots of these local uh, uh, stories surrounding this mosque, how Bhima Palli came to this particular region, converted a lot of people and how she became a guardian for the fishermen folk who are going to the sea and this is in in uh, some ways this is also a parallel kind of a belief as um, the the fisher folk always keep the sea as a kind of goddess and uh, when they uh, go to the sea they think that they, there is a goddess uh, supporting them but in, in the case of Bhima Baby, it's not just that she was kind of a saint, a uh, 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 um, uh, <clears throat> deep passion, attachment, uh, something like that for these uh, uh, Muslim communities around the region. Uh, they, the, this particular space was also emerging in the past 50, 60 years in uh, the history of, uh, where, where, when the history of Muslims in the country was kind of changing and uh, the, the political power that Muslims in the, enjoyed in the country was changing over the years, this particular community, this particular region also became a very crucial space in the geographical map of this uh, political, um, uh, ge geographical map of the state. <clears throat> Why uh, so, um, uh, when we think further, this uh, space even became kind of a counter space where the uh, political authority of the state could not engage with beyond a point. And this is a region where you have a lot of friction with the government. For instance, in the uh, 90s, there was this huge police firing um, in this particular region where the state tried to enter the space and during a, a moment of conflict and uh, there was a kind of uh, very 
uh, tense situation and a lot of uh, a few Muslims, young yeah, Muslims died in the police firing. And this space now it has its own kind of a governmentality, you can say, uh, and they think that the Mabibi is the guardian of the space and it emerges as a kind of uh, 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 parallel market, parallel uh, governance, parallel kind of existence. So you can call it actually a counter space. Um, and uh, likewise, in many pockets in Kerala, there are most where you have a woman as the a uh, saint who is buried in that nearby that you know the Sunni tradition of uh, uh, tomb worship. And in many of these uh, regions, you have uh, such uh, most where you have uh, the story of a woman uh, being buried there. Then suddenly there is a kind of miraculous um, uh, kind of presence in that region. And then the uh, mostly it's about presence surrounding the region emerges as a kind of counter um, uh, force to both the state and also to the kind of aristocratic, authoritarian, uh, re religious uh, seats, which will be uh, more textual and more patriarchal, I would say. So this was a kind of uh, fascinating thing for me to uh, see and understand. And uh, the entire first chapter is based on discussion of this and how we move on from the myth related to a woman leader or a woman goddess or a woman uh, saint from there how we move on to the idea of a counter space and uh, uh, the second chapter which is particularly what I want to uh, give a little more emphasize here is put on is based on the reform uh, movements uh, among the Muslims in Kerala uh, and I say reform moments, or I try to place these political activities and literary activities within the frame of reform movement, because early 20th century reform movements in Kerala is quite famous like that of the Bengal reform movements. Uh, when we look at the history of the state, this is when the state is supposed to have assumed a Kerala um, for those who are not familiar with this region, should know that it's the most literate part of India. It, uh, the state claims to have a 100% literacy rate and uh, um, uh, have a, and it, it has a, a very vibrant left readership and uh, uh, they, therefore it, it has a very different progressive kind of, uh, um, uh, you would say, continents, uh, when you compare it with other Indian states. And from that kind of a position, this 20th century reform movements kind of uh, um, uh, assume uh, a cultural imagination tries to, uh, when the Kerala talks about its history, this is uh, the space from where it takes off as a progressive uh, uh, liberal kind of a state. That is, that's how they look at 20th century reform movements. Now, in this kind of a context, the publishing houses run by Muslims and the, the large number of Muslim readership, it, it, it somehow kind of forms uh, form a misfit when we think about this uh, very literate, very progressive kind of uh, state in India. And therefore, like I wanted to focus on the writings published in these uh, journals, journals mostly run by uh, Muslims and uh, uh, women's uh, journals run by women or uh, women readers. Uh, uh, I thought this was quite uh, engaging and this was an interesting phenomenon because uh, uh, when we think in the larger context of a liberal feminist uh, perspective existing in a very progressive space, Muslims and Muslim women do not fit into the um, uh, uh, in, in, into that pattern. Uh, and therefore, uh, when I uh, looked at uh, Muslim reform movements, I felt that there is one interesting thing that was coming out, uh, was a totally different idea of gender and a totally different idea of nation itself. Because <clears throat> the 
publish uh, the the journals that I look at, uh, ranging from a period of 1920 to 1970. These uh, journals, these little magazines, you cannot call them nationalist in their sentiments. They could not also be treated as religious literature, but rather they engage with a lot of questions, a lot of questions which perplex us, but at the same time, these are, uh, uh, in, in many ways, we cannot kind of fix them within the uh, circuit of those uh, nationalist writings of the time. Uh, and uh, uh, they, while they were informed uh, by the wider movements uh, that was happening all over the country in terms of nationalism, in terms of this gender fixing that uh, a lot of historians have talked about in terms of uh, thinking about gender uh, in terms of the uh, uh, upper caste Hindu woman, and then trying to assign gender roles, uh, the, which was happening all over the country, that was uh, slightly different when uh, it, it was not happening in the same manner when we think about Muslims uh, uh, and these uh, Muslims in this uh, reform context. So uh, uh, the a lot of uh, these uh, writings. For instance, if you look at a brief history of periodical literature of this uh, particular period, they were work like uh, um, I, I'll name a few of those journals. You will see Muslim Mahila by Musa Kuti Sahib. There is uh, Halima Bibi, who was a major publisher of the time. Uh, she had uh, a few uh, magazines and uh, one was Muslim Vanita, the other one was called Bharata Chandrika. And then like due to a lot of limitations, some for a few years she didn't publish. Then she came back with another journal. Uh, and they wrote, and there were journals titled Ansari, Al Islam, Mapila Review. Uh, Mapilas are like, you know, the Muslims of Kerala mostly are called, uh, especially in the Northern region, they are called Mapilas. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, these were all journals uh, uh, that existed during this time. Um, and uh, uh, in uh, one of, uh, uh, I want to read out a few of those, uh, um, um, a few extracts from some of these journals. Uh, one was like how the men uh, uh, from the community looked at women and the idea of empowerment and the, uh, the question related to reform. So there is this famous uh, Muslim reformer, Wakkam Abdul Qadir Maulavi, uh, in an article titled Islam and Women. This was published in a journal titled Ali Islam. And this came out in 1918. And this is my translation. So he says it is equally foolish to say that polygamy is is established by Islam as a practice, as to say that Parda is a Muslim practice. Uh, the so-called civilized Greek and Roman men used to keep their women away from other men. Greece, which is supposed to be the sacred center of civilization and the birthplace of Socrates and Plato, used to treat its women like animals. Uh, so this was like 1980. And the article goes on to different and the virtues of Islamic way of life. Uh, and it claims that uh, 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 all communities practice gender segregation at some point in history. And uh, uh, then there is, uh, so basically the idea was to different Islam in terms of the critics extended uh, towards the religion, both from the colonizers' perspective and also from the Hindu reformers' perspective. Uh, so um, I think there is another important uh, 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 article which came out in 1934, uh, which talks about the video remarriage which were happening in the Nambudiri community, a Brahmin community in Kerala. Uh, at the time, uh, so this was a Hindu reformist activity. The young, uh, educated Hindu men of the time uh, was uh, were quite 
worried about the plight of widows in their community and they assembled together to kind of uh, remarry the widows in the community. Uh, so based on that, like as a response to these widow remarriages which were happening in the Hindu community, there is uh, uh, this article uh, which says the line of widows in Hindu community have been miserable. In the past, they were burnt alive in the funeral pyres of their husbands as per with Vedic instructions. But Islam has answered the plea of the widow. Uh, not only that they were given equal status with other women in the society, their insecurity had been addressed by the uh, 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 insecurity had been addressed to by the instruction you should marry the, the the scriptural instruction you should marry the widows in your community since this instruction has been strictly followed widow grievances are absent in islam now after years of suffering hindus have come forward willingly and this is a good thing um, and uh, so this this kind of engagement with Hinduism um, and even comparisons with Christianity, uh, Hinduism, their treatment of women. This was a common thing that we would come across in um, many of these, uh, many of the entries and these journals. Uh, and then uh, to uh, uh, think about what the women, these were like mostly responses of men uh, to uh, some pertinent questions existing in the society. But uh, uh, what I found interesting in, uh, in terms of women, what women wrote in these journals, how they responded to the call for reform, that uh, uh, is slightly different. But it, it, it ranged from all kinds of things. Some women were just talking about a very uh, difficult kind of situation they're experiencing. Uh, a group of women, most of them, like unless they are quite known, most of them write uh, anonymously, and uh, there is a, a journal. Uh, there is an entry, for instance, titled "Are We Not Lucky?" And they say this is a group of students. They are not even mentioning who are writing it, but it says like we are member of human species, and somebody should listen to our grievances. We need equal rights, and we cannot like you know live in ignorance forever. We want education, etc. The kind of demands that women at the kind of uh, a very important juncture in uh, history would make in terms of uh, the right to education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, they were like, you know, many of these uh, journals were discussing women's rights, but not from a secular standpoint. But at the same time, like they were also not kind of denying uh, uh, the the emerging modern space altogether. They wanted a share in that, but modernity was not something restricted to the context of colonialism and nationalism for the Muslim women or the uh, Muslim community as such. It was rather I what I found interesting or why what I want to uh, kind of uh, propose is that it was more of a transnational experience for the Muslims in Kerala. Partly because Kerala had always uh, this uh, very open kind of uh, communication and uh, uh, transfer of ideas with the Middle East and Far East, uh, 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 starting from the first century onwards uh, uh, through Arab traders and much more, and Islam also. If you think about the presence of Islam in this region, it's not through the conquest or not through uh, the Mughals who came to uh, India in a later period, but this mostly Islam came to Kerala almost at its time of birth in Arabia through the Arab traders. So the, there is a kind of simultaneous history or parallel history between Arabia and uh, Kerala in terms of the spread of Islam. So therefore, uh, uh, Modernity itself was a transnational experience for uh, was a transnational experience for women of the time, and mostly they were talking in terms of what Islam is giving them in uh, in terms of empowerment, in terms of uh, their rights, and they were like quite clever to also demand their rights using the idea of uh, uh, 
the religious text itself. Uh, you see uh, that Quran ensures these rights, and we do we don't want to subscribe to the misleading interpretations given by a lot of these priests and others. And uh, 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 so uh, th there are uh, um, uh, writers like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Halima Bibi and Tangama Male. A lot of them, um, they, uh, they were trying to say that uh, 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 even though there is a vocabulary of difference between the Hindu woman and uh, Muslim women in terms of uh, uh, their religious identity, uh, what the Muslim women of the time uh, were asserting through their writings was a totally different idea of uh, uh, sisterhood, not what the contemporary ideas of feminism, especially liberal feminism, would subscribe to. Um, uh, you might say, like, you know, what surprised me was in a 1927 uh, journal uh, uh, titled Muslim Mitra, you see a translation of Rokia Sakawat Hussein's uh, uh, word Sultana Street. Uh, this is 1927, and the distance between these two regions is like uh, Bengal and Kerala is quite far, but at the same time, so this kind of literary transactions between the Muslim community that was so empowering uh, for women of the time uh, to, to, to read, to engage with. And they were also, but at the same time, they were also trying to uh, read from uh, other parts of the world in terms of uh, religious texts, their explanations, trying to always locate Islam in a larger perspective, trying to say that even though we live in this country at this moment, there are questions related to our identity in terms of our faith, which cannot be contained within the particular moment in history. Um, uh, there is, uh, uh, and the knowledge, the idea of knowledge was a predominant thing in terms of like, you know, we need to uh, uh, learn, we need to know. Uh, there is uh, the same issue of Muslim Mitra that I said uh, published Sultana's Dream. Uh, there is this uh, uh, article on Muslim women and education. Um, and it says... Uh, I'm so uh, sorry to interrupt you, Shireen, but two minute warning. Yeah, I'll, I'll wind up. So this particular... Uh, um, uh, uh, journal, it was talking both in terms of uh, secular education, it was uh, like, you know, there is this article which says from a person named Sainaba Baby, it says education is important and we need to join schools and we need to learn, we have to have this modern education as it is. But then at the same time, religion is very important and we need to uh, uh, be very sure about our faith, our practices. Um, and uh, uh, there is a kind of, so what she says is you need to rediscover the religious text, which again, for me was a very interesting idea to see how women engaged with Quran and how they tried to have a different, totally different experience of reading uh, Quran from their perspective. So the uh, what I was uh, arguing uh, by presenting these uh, uh, art, uh, the, these uh, writings from Muslim women during this particular period is to see that uh, uh, gender in terms of like you know the uh, structuring through gender was not happening. This same way in all the communities in India. Uh, so if you think that the home uh, world dichotomy or inside outside dichotomy in some ways restructured gender uh, in the upper caste Hindu uh, society community of the time for Muslims, it was uh, at least from the writings from the South, um, I, I, I argue that it was a totally different experience and gender was uh, a large uh, uh, agenda was not used to restructure the national space between inside and the outside of home and the world it was rather a, a transnational experience which i further uh, would like to uh, pursue in my uh, later work also 
Um, uh, thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you so much for that presentation, um, Shireen. It was it was really interesting. Um, and I've actually uh, read your books. It was really interesting to go over that as well and then see how you want to take it further. Um, I think it was also really great for this focus on um, different communities um, and you know the role of Muslim women and the status of Muslim women and how they operate in these different communities. Um, and that actually brings me to our next speaker, because I think um, it's really interesting because you talk to us um, about Kerala quite a bit. And our next speaker is hopefully going to talk to us about Kashmir a little bit. And we're going to go back in time.